This video is sponsored by Skillshare. So when you're a content creator or an entertainer or artist of any kind, there's a delicate balance between making stuff that you want to make and making things that you think your audience might be interested in. Some fortunate folks have figured out a way to make both of those things line up most of the time. Due to the way that I've grown this channel, I'm not really one of those people. If it was up to me, I would talk about Marvel movies and Super Smash Brothers on this channel way more and I would get no views. It's fine, I get to make YouTube videos for a living, do not feel bad for me. But even within the political and social topics that I normally talk about on this channel, sometimes there are topics that are definitely interesting but also impossibly complicated. Or topics that are easier to cover but require me to entertain obnoxious bad faith arguments, which isn't always that fun for me. However, some of those obnoxious or complicated topics are ones that people are very interested in and ask a lot of questions about, especially when they become divisive social media buzzwords. So with all that said, let's talk about critical race theory. Hi, I'm T1J. Follow me. This video, like all my videos, would not be possible without my members and patrons, including homies like Wu Feng Zhou, Kaliza, Sean Locke, and EJ95. If you'd like to support the channel, you can become a homie yourself by clicking the join button below the video or by checking out my page on Patreon. So generally in a video like this, I would start out by defining the thing that I wanna talk about, in this case, critical race theory or CRT for short. And I've been getting a lot of emails and messages about this topic as it seems to have become a bit of a talking point on both the left and the right, but especially the right. The problem is like most talking points, people don't seem to have an agreement on what the definition of critical race theory even is. And they kind of just talk past each other and define it in the way that best suits their current argument. So the first statement is the most important thing about you is your race. Do you agree or disagree with that? It's just a way of examining society and history without pretending that racism doesn't exist. But the best definition should probably come from the people who develop, study, and teach it. And to be clear, just like anything else, there are competing ideas within the field of critical race theory, but I'll try to cover the basics. Critical race theory as a concept has existed since at least the 1970s and basically seeks to examine how race and racism interact with our understanding of law and politics. It does this by challenging the common liberal wisdom that shrewd rationalism and colorblind impartiality is the best way to solve social problems. Instead, favoring a focus on the lived experience of racial minorities, as well as more flexible interpretations of the law to promote better policy and better social outcomes for marginalized racial groups. But it really seems like over the past few years, CRT has become short shorthand for basic sociological discussions of race in general. Wikipedia says critical race theory examines social, cultural, and legal issues as they relate to race and racism. Is critical race theory just like talking about race stuff? Have I been doing critical race theory this whole time? I haven't. You'll see. So here's my dilemma. Do I make a video about the political philosophy of critical race theory and its criticisms of liberalism, which is way more interesting, but also way more complicated and possibly less relevant to the audience? Or do I make a video about the dumbed down version of this debate, which is basically responding to the exact same reactionary arguments that we've heard over and over since the beginning of time. Reverse racism, playing the race card, why does everything have to be about race? You know, all that stuff which actually seems more relevant to the mainstream conversations that people are having, but it's also kind of annoying. I don't know, I guess I'll try a little bit of both. So the underlying premise on which most of this is based is the idea as put by many critical race theorists that the United States and perhaps the West in general is, or at least contains, a regime of white supremacy. Now this is an emotionally charged term to say the least. When we hear the term white supremacy, I think a lot of our minds immediately jump to things like the Klan, neo-Nazis, etc. A clarification is offered by scholar Francis Lee Ansley. By white supremacy, I do not mean to allude only to the self-conscious racism of white supremacist hate groups. I refer instead to a political, economic, and cultural system in which whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources, 
conscious and unconscious ideas of white superiority and entitlement are widespread, and relations of white dominance and non-white subordination are daily reenacted across a broad array of institutions and social settings. Essentially, white people are the dominant racial group, and they have a disproportionate amount of legal, economic, social, and political power when compared to other racial groups. In virtually every American institution, white people tend to have more power and tend to have better outcomes than non-white Americans, and those advantages get passed on through their families and communities. Meanwhile, the disproportionately negative outcomes get passed on through the families and communities of people of color, which is one reason why we refer to these problems as systemic and not just a myriad of individual cases. I think we should be able to agree that this is basically true. The term regime somewhat implies that the system was intentionally created and is consciously maintained, which I acknowledge is a little more contentious. The second and I guess more controversial premise that's been taken for granted by CRT has been expressed by the quote, racism is ordinary, not aberrational. Normal science, the usual way society does business, the common everyday experience of most people of color in this country. Basically the idea that racism not only exists, but is an ongoing massive problem that has infiltrated most of our institutions and interactions. Now this is much harder to believe if you have a very narrow definition of what counts as racism, but when you understand the nuance of racism and the many ways and degrees that it can manifest itself, I'd argue that this is also pretty obviously true. Although I would say it requires paying attention to statistical data and also the stories of the lived experiences of people of color. So given that, critical race theory aims to begin the process of dismantling these white supremacist structures through what they refer to as race conscious analysis and policy. Liberalism has this basic idea of why don't we all just chill? Don't hurt nobody. If someone does hurt somebody, we'll, we'll get the state involved. But otherwise, you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. CRT argues that this might work to some extent for stamping out active and overt racism that causes obvious harm to people. So things like the Civil Rights Act of 1964 or the Brown versus Board of Education decision would be considered liberal solutions to social problems. But they argue it doesn't sufficiently address the underlying subtle, often hidden forms of oppression. Essentially, they argue that liberalism takes a passive approach to racial justice, waiting for an instance of obvious wrongdoing and then reacting eventually. While critical race theorists, who often call themselves crits, by the way, which I will start using because it's shorter, the crits take their cues from Marxism, acknowledging up front that ongoing oppression is taking place and an active approach is needed to solve it. Now, it's clear to me that ongoing oppression is taking place in the world, and I also prefer active rather than passive solutions. However, I don't really like the Marxist framework of separating people into oppressed and oppressor classes an idea that CRT also borrows. I don't like the idea that the enemy of the people is other people. And even if it was, it certainly isn't every single member of a certain class. The focus, in my opinion, has to be on attacking systems and structures through political advocacy and social activism, which should hopefully result in more equitable political power as it has in the past. But I'm a filthy liberal, so what do I know? Beat you to it, Reddit. The concept of race consciousness is also clearly inspired by Marxism, which discusses class consciousness. Some crits believe that at minimum, there should be organizations and government bodies whose sole purpose is to analyze and respond to political problems strictly through the lens of race. But ideally, all individuals should consider race highly significant. This is a direct departure from the liberal idea of colorblindness. Some liberals want to not see race and instead focus on behavior and character. And the idea is that this will naturally lead to more equitable outcomes, both socially and legally, as long as we avoid violence violating each other's rights. While other liberals concede that in a society with racial inequality, it's impossible to not see race. And 
kind of rude to suggest it. But the goal is to remove racial oppression so that we can be colorblind. Crits seem to reject both of these. They argue that because of the unique history of America, colorblindness in any case would only occur as a result of people of color assimilating themselves into the white status quo. So it wouldn't really be colorblindness after all, it would just be one color white. So they tend to reject concepts like colorblindness, integration, or assimilation. They fundamentally disagree with the melting pot analogy for America and other ethnically diverse nations. In some cases, they even seem to support forms of segregation. For example, Derek Bell, one of the pioneers of critical race theory, argued that instead of struggling to integrate into white schools, black people should instead build and bolster their own black schools. But in general, crits call for a complete analytical deconstruction of the liberal ideals that America was founded on. When the founding fathers wrote the Declaration of Independence or the Bill of Rights, they didn't do so with slavery or racial inequality at the forefront of their minds. They imagined America in a vacuum, and they tried to create principles that they thought could be applied universally, notably principles based on European philosophy and the Enlightenment, logic, science, objectivity, impartiality, liberty, democracy, things like that. Critical race theory wants to re-examine those ideas specifically through the lens of race. So for example, the United States does not currently have federal hate speech laws. But if we wanted to create a law to deter racial hate speech, we might write a law that says hate speech against another person on the basis of their race is illegal. A crit might reject this impartiality though. Even though the law refers to race, it is not race conscious. A race conscious law might say something like, only hate speech against racial minorities is illegal. Now this kind of stuff freaks out a certain segment of the population. A lot of people call it reverse racism, although I feel like I haven't heard that term in a while. I've always loved the term reverse racism because by its very nature, it implies that it's a different kind of racism than real racism, which is kind of the point we were trying to make the entire time. And I've talked several times on this channel about how white people do not experience systemic racism. So the instances of discrimination or prejudice that they may occasionally receive does not have anywhere near the same long-standing implications. But even so, I'm not really sure what the CRT argument is here. In the case of hate speech, for example, Critz argue that the American concept of free speech simply perpetuates the racist status quo. And while I'm a pretty big free speech guy, I can acknowledge that certain forms of hate speech could genuinely be harmful, which could justify these kinds of restrictions on speech as many other countries in the world have already done. I also acknowledge that this harm is much greater for marginalized groups than it is for privileged groups. But I'm not sure why we should avoid preventing harm to privileged groups just because there's less of it. Some crits believe that it is permissible to discriminate against white people if it results in a benefit for non-white people. I generally prefer to search for solutions where everybody benefits. But that's kind of the main thing about CRT. The theory makes the assumption that since America is a white supremacist regime, that all of the ideas associated with it, like legal neutrality or facts over feelings, are also white supremacists. And I don't think that follows logically. I mean, maybe some of them are, but maybe some of them aren't. But reason and logic are white European values, apparently, so I guess that's how they get around it. That's kind of a joke, but it's also kind of the primary criticism I have of critical race theory, and I guess a lot of postmodern philosophy in general. Clearly, they must appeal to some semblance of reason and logic to write all of their books and make coherent arguments. They also occasionally reference statistical data about racial oppression, which is a good way to prove that it's actually happening. But when the logic or data doesn't suit their arguments, they just dismiss it as just another aspect of the white status quo. Either way, it's still super interesting, and there are some serious ideas that, when engaged in good faith, are actually pretty compelling. 
And this is why it's a problem when people on both sides misrepresent what critical race theory is. The conservative establishment in America has successfully stirred up hysteria about teaching critical race theory in schools. Closer look at controversial academic movement. The critical race theory movement in the headlines as Florida becomes the latest state to ban schools from teaching about systemic racism. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure no school is sitting down your fourth grader and telling them that they're a member of the oppressor class, which must be eventually overthrown. I got high school age family members, gotta say, I never heard any of them mention their critical race theory class. What I think is happening is that Republicans are using a scary buzzword like critical race theory to further whitewash American history lessons, as well as drum up general disdain for the left and woke culture. Just move in that Overton window, you know how they do. It's not critical race theory, it's racism. And it might work. Teachers in some states are concerned that they won't be able to adequately teach basic historical events of American history that happen to deal with race, like the Trail of Tears or the Civil Rights Movement. And the history of people of color in America is already so poorly taught. I went to all black schools and we still weren't taught that much about black history. We just like made posters of Harriet Tubman and Martin Luther King Jr. with glue and construction paper every February. Meanwhile, I had the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria drilled into my fucking head. But the way the left talks about critical race theory isn't always honest either. Critical race theory just says, let's pay attention to what has happened in this country and how what has happened in this country is continuing to create differential outcomes so we can become that country that we say we are. Conservative leaders have drummed up this false outrage once again about the so-called Marxist philosophy that undermines the very ideals that America was founded on. But here's the thing, critical race theory is that. It's not just thinking about racism. It's a discussion of a radical overhaul of our legal and political processes. And I get that optics is important, but like, be honest. But like I said before, there seems to be more than one definition of critical race theory, and people just use the one that is the most expedient in the moment, which makes this a really hard thing to talk about. Conservatives use the radical language of the academic discussion of critical race theory to make people afraid of talking about race in general. That way they can preserve the illusion that America is this awesome, infallible nation that, yeah, we had some problems in the past, but we took care of it. It's all good now. It isn't. While the left uses the more benign language of, we're just talking about racism, either because they're unfamiliar of the actual academic discussions or because they know that most people would probably find it pretty weird, if not concerning. I fully agree with the central message of critical race theory, that we should take a closer look at how racism permeates through our institutions and use this information to figure out a solution to not just racial oppression, but all forms of oppression. I also agree with the crits in that the nuance of the general concept of racism needs to be better understood. I love this quote from Critical Race Theory and Introduction. Everyone has heard the story about Eskimos who have 26 words for different kinds of snow. Imagine the opposite predicament, a society that has only one word, say racism, for a phenomenon that is much more complex than that. For example, intentional racism, unintentional racism, unconscious racism, institutional racism, racism tinged with homophobia or sexism, racism that takes the form of indifference or coldness, and white privilege, reserving favors, smiles, kindness, the best stories, one's most charming side, and invitations to real intimacy for one's own kind or class. I've made videos about this very thing. Critz also acknowledge, as I do, the power of stories and narratives. The right is amazing at creating narratives that further their political goals. This whole backlash against critical race theory is itself a pretty effective narrative. While the left often simply rests on their laurels and complains when their messages don't stick. I've learned very clearly over the past few years that most people don't really give much of a shit about facts or data or logic. People like stories that confirm their biases or trigger strong emotions, whether or not those stories are totally true. But that doesn't mean that facts, data, and logic don't matter. 
Critical race theory is openly antagonistic to those concepts. As I've said, they argue that because they contribute to the status quo, they must themselves also be racist, except when they need to use them, of course. But I don't know how we can even begin to solve problems or even identify problems in the first place without some sort of objective standard by which to understand like what is real. Otherwise, it's just all arbitrary and like survival of the fittest or survival of the most convincing, I guess. And things don't have to be true or good in order to be convincing. Many, if not most things are open to interpretation, but I think that there are some things which are simply true to any honest, good faith observer. It's true that one plus one equals two, just like it's true that black people are incarcerated at a rate many times more than white people in America like you can prove it. And I personally think this kind of data is essential to efficient political organizing. Sometimes data and facts are misused and mishandled, but the solution to that is proper methodology, peer review, corroborating studies, things like that, so we can get as close to the truth as possible. I also disagree with another tenet of CRT, which I haven't brought up yet. It's called the empathic fallacy. I've said many times that one of the best solutions to bad ideas is better ideas. And I don't mean like the weird marketplace of ideas type shit. I simply mean putting good ideas out into the world so that it's there, it exists so people can find it. That's kind of one of the main motivations for this channel. Critical race theory opposes this. They claim that this only works if the listeners have empathy. And they believe that racial empathy is limited if not non-existent in our unequal and divided society. But I know this isn't true because people like me and others who try our best to put good ideas out into the world constantly receive messages from people saying that we've informed their perspective, if not outright changed their mind on things. I guess the crits might say that the change is too slow, and maybe it is, but it's not a fallacy. And I would think that any change is better than no change. So critical race theory is pretty complex and I have truly only scratched the surface here. If you wanna learn more about it, I suggest starting out with Critical Race Theory and Introduction by Richard Delgado and Jean Stefanczyk, which I referenced a couple times in this video. Academic and philosophical texts can get real wordy and dense, but this one is pretty easy to understand. I'm not really sure how critical race theory became such a big deal. Apparently it picked up a lot of steam after the publication of the 1619 Project, a Pulitzer Prize winning long form New York Times piece from 2019, which basically encourages a similar type of race consciousness. And it has faced its own bout of controversy. Some of the ideas of critical race theory have made their way into mainstream civil rights discourse, but much of it is still pretty fringe and not widely accepted or taught. The conservative website criticalrace.org compiles information about colleges and universities that supposedly teach critical race theory or require their faculty and staff to adhere to it. But when you actually look at the website, for one, it conflates critical race theory with the general idea of social justice or anti-racism, which it is not. But also, literally almost every entry says something like, this school has not implemented critical race theory yet, but they might. Seriously, go look. Even though CRT is somewhat of a radical theory, it still seems conservative outrage has made a bigger deal out of something than it actually is. But I think it's interesting enough to look into. We should always be open to hearing alternate ways of thinking, even if we don't fully agree. You might learn something new or evolve your perspective. That's just me though. What do you think? Big shout outs to the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives, offering thousands of inspiring classes on topics including illustration, design, filmmaking, business, and more. Skillshare is focused on helping you learn no matter your schedule or skill level. That means the video classes are not too long, but also well-produced and ad-free. And they're always launching new classes so you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. In this video, I mentioned the importance of narratives and storytelling. And a class that I've been looking into to help improve my storytelling skills is Storytelling 101, Character, Conflict, Context, and Craft by Daniel Jose Older. 
I really like that he breaks down his writing process in very easy to understand organized sections. If you'd like to try out this class or any of Skillshare's thousands of amazing classes, the first 1,000 of you to click the link in the description will get a free one month trial of Skillshare. So go ahead and click that link below and start learning today. And remember, by supporting sponsors like Skillshare, you not only get access to a great service, but you also support me and help me take my content to the next level.